Columban Calendar 2019 Cover Giovanni Bellini Madonna and Child of the Pair 1485-87 The great Venetian master's charming painting of the Virgin and Child takes its name from the pair resting on a ledge that runs across the foreground of the composition. The figure of the Virgin, who is depicted a little over half length, turns slightly to the viewer's right. The shadow projected against the brilliant green silk behind the mother's head establishes depth, together with a sense of proximity of the figures to the spectator's world. Mary supports the child on her lap, her hands gently steadying her child. While Mary's gaze directs the viewer's attention to her child, Christ looks into the distance. The child's intent expression points to a maturity beyond his years. This hint of knowledge beyond a human baby's ability reminds the viewer of Christ's dual nature, human and divine. Bellini's paintings of religious subjects, as we see in this work, imagined the sacred figures as physically and emotionally present, as if in the natural world, our world. This illusionistic device helps to bridge the divine world with the earthly realm of the viewer. Like the pair that similarly hovers in a space tantalizingly near, Bellini's artistry brings us to the threshold where the virgin and child, in all their physical immediacy, evoke the miracle of the Incarnation. God became one like us. January, Andrea del Sarto, St. Agne, 16th century, private collection. The Florentine artist Andrea del Sarto achieved considerable renown in his native city and throughout Tuscany. A contemporary of Raphael, Leonardo and Michelangelo, his work reveals the influence of these great masters. However, Andrea's work expresses a sensitivity to the expressive power of color, which distinguishes his art at this time. The reproduction of St. Agne is based on a painting by Andrea. This reproductive technique, known as chromolithography, became popular in the 19th century. Prints after famous paintings could be mass-produced to allow art lovers to collect hand-coloured copies of favourite paintings. The half-length image of St. Agne comes from a multi-panelled altarpiece in the Duomo in Pisa. Agne was believed to have been martyred in the 4th century. Her legend recalls how Agne, refusing to make sacrifices to the pagan goddess Vesta, was arrested. Despite attempts to drag her nude to a brothel, she was miraculously protected from these and other torments. Eventually, she died after a dagger was plunged into her throat. She appears here with her attributes. The palm branch, symbol of her martyrdom, and the lamb, a charming wordplay on her name in Latin and Greek. Agne in Greek means pure or chaste, while in Latin, agnus is the word for lamb. Both symbols attest to Agne's resolute commitment to the Christian faith. Agne was said to have appeared to her parents after her death, flanked by a lamb. February, Guercino. Abraham banishes Hagar, 1657. The story, familiar from Genesis, of how Abraham took his wife Sarah's young Egyptian slave Hagar as his mistress, became a popular subject for artists in the 17th century. Sarah, we learn, had not been able to bear children, so she convinced Abraham to have a child with her maid, Hagar. The child Hagar bore was named Ishmael. Abraham loved his son, but Sarah came to resent Hagar. Some years later, Sarah too became pregnant and bore a son named Isaac. Fearing that her own son would be forced to share his inheritance with Ishmael, Sarah demanded that Abraham banish Hagar and Ishmael. Guercino depicts this moment, the tension and drama of the narrative revealed in the figure's gestures and facial expressions. Abraham dominates the scene. His commanding gestures 
make clear that Hagar and Ishmael must leave. Hagar's tearful gaze, directed not at Abraham, but at Sarah, signals Hagar's vulnerability and powerlessness. Sarah, her back turned from the distraught mother and child, becomes an enigmatic presence in the drama. The older woman's pose hints at Sarah's contempt for the younger woman. Yet, as we learn, Hagar and Ishmael survive being cast out into the desert. God reveals himself to Hagar and promises that her son will become the leader of a nation. And so often in stories from the Hebrew scripture, this tale reminds us how, like Abraham and Sarah, we forget to trust in God's promises. March, Guido Reni, St. Joseph, 17th century, private collection. The 17th century saw a great development in the devotion to St. Joseph. Of course, the church had always honored Mary's husband and the father of Jesus. However, the post-Tridentine church sought to remind the faithful through paintings of the fidelity of this holy man. Guido Reni, a native of the North Italian city of Bologna, painted some of the finest images of St. Joseph. In contrast to earlier images of the saint, René depicted St. Joseph with the Christ child or alone, as we see here. The detail reproduced reveals an older man, his downturned gaze directed to an open book. The lower section of the painting is not included in this reproduction. René combines a realistic portrayal of an older man, note his white beard and lined brow, with the symbols of sanctity, like the thin, bold border of the halo that surrounds his head. This combination of the human and the sacred helps evoke the humanity of St. Joseph for the viewer. René imagines a saint quietly attending to his reading, a detail not included in the reproduction. For the 17th century viewer, perhaps a lay person, this type of activity might well prompt the spectator to remember the devotion of St. Joseph to his family. April, William Adolf Bouguereau, The Holy Women at the Tomb of Christ, 1890. Scenes of Christ's passion and resurrection are amongst the most familiar images from the life of Christ. The French artist William Adolphe Bouguereau chooses the episode we know from all four Gospel narratives. It is the moment when the holy women who have come to anoint Christ's body find that the tomb is empty. Intrinsically dramatic, Bouguereau heightens the viewer's expectations through an arresting storytelling device. Rather than dwell on the empty tomb, what we encounter instead is these women's reactions to the mystery of Christ's resurrection. Dressed soberly in costumes which suggest biblical times, the women register their shock and confusion through gestures. The viewer, like the women, gazes into the tomb, only to be confronted by the angel, who announces to the women that Jesus has risen. Together with the angel's commanding presence, the mysterious white light which fills the space beyond the entry to the tomb, evokes divine power. It is as if the tomb has been transformed by the miracle of Christ's victory over sin and death. Bouguereau asks us to put ourselves in the place of these faithful, courageous women. Like these women, we too are invited by the angel to go quickly and tell his disciples of Christ's resurrection. This divine call to action compels us to respond with the same love and faith as those women 2,000 years ago. May, Nicolas Poussin, Rest on the Flight into Egypt, 1655 to 1657. The French painter Nicolas Poussin spent much of his career in Rome. His work, much sought after by monarchs, popes and the aristocracy throughout Europe, are notable for the clarity of composition and a treatment of figures and surroundings that evokes the measured grandeur of the classical past. 
His rest on the flight into Egypt infuses this charming story with a classical calm, more typical of a scene from Roman history. This apocryphal story became popular in the years following the Council of Trent, 1543 to 1565. According to the legend, the Virgin, exhausted after the flight from Herod, asks Joseph to stop in order to rest and eat. At first, it seems there's no food or water. However, a spring miraculously appears, and an angel helps Joseph gather dates from a nearby palm tree. In Poussin's interpretation of the story, our attention focuses on the Virgin and Child in the centre of the painting. The strong light which falls upon the mother and child unite the pair, so that their forms anchor the scene both physically and spiritually. Jesus reaches towards the plate of dates. The child's eager gesture appears to delight his young mother. Poussin eschews traditional divine figures like angels. Instead, a young boy offers food to Mary and Jesus. Together with Poussin's emphasis on the natural world, the artist enriched his compositions with scenes which evoked the world of the pagan past. The procession, which moves from right to left in the background, features priests bringing an offering to be presented before the steps of a temple. June, Bernardo Strozzi, The Healing of Tobit, 1632. Stories of travel to exotic lands are a familiar theme throughout the Hebrew scriptures. Often, God sends a man or woman on a dangerous journey far from home in order to test a character's faithfulness. The book of Tobit from the Hebrew Testament tells just such a story. Although this apocryphal tale is not accepted by Protestants, scenes from this charming tale became a staple in Catholic Europe, especially after the Reformation. The Genoese painter and priest Bernardo Strozzi depicts the climactic moment of the story. Almost certainly, Strozzi's painting would have been intended for a domestic setting. The story concerns a young man, Tobias, who is sent on a journey far from his home in order to find a cure for his father Tobit's blindness. It is, however, a dangerous mission, and an angel, Raphael, accompanies Tobias to protect him during his journey. Despite encounters with a giant fish and a young woman possessed by a demon, Tobias obtains the miraculous cure after successfully wrestling the fish to death in order to extract the creature's liver, heart and gall. The scene Strozzi imagines features the central characters in the story. The seated figure of Tobit is about to receive the cure for his blindness from the hands of his son, Tobias, at his left. The young man tenderly applies the ointment to his father's eye. Directly opposite Tobias, the anxious figure of Anna, Tobias's mother and Tobit's wife, leans forward, her gaze fixed on her son's delicate application of the cure. Standing between Anna and Tobias is the archangel Raphael, identified by his powerful wings. The angel looks on Tobit intently, as he waits for Tobit's sight to be restored. With his left hand, Raphael points to the dish that Tobias holds in his left hand. This story, which concerns a son's devotion to his father, helped reinforce the ideal of filial duty and respect, themes of importance amongst families throughout Europe. July, Hippolyte de la Roche, Saint Veronica, French art of the first half of the 19th century pursued a generally rather traditional style. Typical of a tendency to look to the great masters of the Renaissance, painters like Ippolo de la Roche combined fine draftsmanship, considered the basis of excellence in painting, with a rather grand narrative style. Paintings like the Saint Veronica interpreted this traditional scene from the life of Christ in a highly dramatic manner. The figure of Saint Veronica is based on a legendary tale and is not found in the Gospels. Her name offers a clue to the origins of this story. Veronica 
derives from the Latin vera icon, in English, true icon. Thus, Veronica is known as the woman who rushed forward with a cloth to wipe Christ's face on the way to Calvary. Veronica's spontaneous act of compassion was rewarded with the cloth, which miraculously bore the image of Christ's face. In the Middle Ages, it was believed that this cloth was preserved in St. Peter's in Rome. In an age of pilgrimage, the Veronica, as the cloth was known, became the focus of great devotion. In Delaroche's painting, Veronica lies sprawled across the foreground of the painting. The miraculous cloth, depicted in the upper right of the scene, features the image of Christ, the object of the viewer's veneration. However, because Veronica looks away from the cloth, it's not clear what moment of the story is portrayed. Only a few details hint at the setting. The stone and exterior walls of a building behind the sprawling figure of Veronica suggests an outdoor scene. The viewer is left to contemplate Veronica's rather forlorn figure. Her pose evokes dejection, even despair. Dororosh confronts the viewer with the aftermath of Veronica's impetuous, though kindly action. Her encounter with Christ provokes a profound spiritual transformation suggested by her state of collapse. August, Bartolome Esteban Moia, the death of St. Clair. St. Clair, 1194 to 1263, together with St. Francis of Assisi, created a spiritual movement in the 13th century, which challenged the prevailing religious and social values of the time. Founder of the Order of the Poor Clares, St. Clair was born into a wealthy family in the Umbrian town of Assisi. Impressed by the preaching of St. Francis, St. Clair turned her back on wealth and privilege by escaping her family's home to join Francis and his companions. Francis imagined a church inspired by the life of Christ. Clair embraced this vision by following Francis's call to follow in the steps of Christ, even if that meant a life of poverty and service to the most marginalized. In the late Middle Ages, such a way of life challenged a church, often more concerned with worldly claims to authority and power. However, Claire's example immediately attracted followers. At the time of her death, her way of life attracted hundreds of women throughout Europe. Murillo's depiction of the moment of Claire's death follows traditional accounts. By dividing the scene into two distinct halves, the artist signals to the viewer Claire's passage from earthly to heavenly life. At the left, members of Claire's order gather around the dying woman. The women are joined by friars, whose presence testifies to their devotion to St. Clair. The grief of the women is palpable. Through gesture and facial expression, Claire's companions register their sorrow and distress. In contrast to this scene of loss, the right half of the painting evokes a very different mood. The atmosphere now appears joyful. Instead of the dark interior, a sky bathed in golden light suggests the presence of the divine. The presence of the five female figures gathered round St. Clair alludes to contemporary accounts of Clair's death. According to testimony, female saints appeared to Clair as she lay dying. As a symbol of Claire's devotion to following the poor Christ, a glorious cloth embroidered in silk and golden thread was draped over her dying body. September, Ernst Josephson, David and Saul, 1878. The earliest Christian's prayer included the Psalms, these powerful expressions of praise and thanks to God were traditionally believed to have been composed by King David. The story of the Hebrew king and ancestor of Christ held a great appeal for artists. At once a great hero, the shepherd boy who becomes king of Israel was also a deeply flawed sinner. The Swedish artist portrays an early episode in David's story. King Saul, who is shown at right, rules over Israel. 
Unfortunately, Saul has disobeyed God and is tormented by evil spirits. Courtiers send for the young shepherd boy David, who is renowned for his skill on the lyre. David enters Saul's service, where he becomes a trusted servant of the troubled king. The scene depicted dramatizes the contrast between the two figures. David, who will succeed Saul as king, appears as a young adolescent boy. Though David faces Saul, the boy's gaze suggests his playing is inspired by God. In contrast, King Saul sits in shadow. His expression and pose evoke a mood of inner turmoil. While David's youthful figure appears bathed in light, the slumped figure of Saul appears trapped in a literally dark space. This dramatic use of light reminds the viewer of David's future role as anointed king of Israel. October, James Tissot, Christ Asleep During the Storm, circa 1886 to 1894. Throughout the 19th century, accomplished artists like the Frenchman Tissot were commissioned by publishers to illustrate scenes from the Hebrew scriptures and the life of Christ. The painting, Christ Asleep During the Storm, forms part of such a series of scenes from Christ's life. The episode recounted in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke recall Christ's miracle at sea. One evening, Jesus and the disciples are crossing the Sea of Galilee in a boat when a sudden storm erupts. As waves rock the boat, the apostles, fearing for their lives, call out to Jesus, who lies asleep in the stern, to save them. Tissot's arresting composition depicts an early moment in the narrative. The darkened sky suggests stormy weather, while waves begin to break around the vessel. In the foreground, several apostles struggle to keep the mast steady. The viewer's gaze is drawn to Christ by the beseeching gestures of several disciples in the foreground. With arms outstretched towards Christ, asleep in the stern, the men's agitated poses recall the disciples' fear that Christ has abandoned them to certain death. Tissot underlines the disciples' agitation through the use of plunging diagonals in order to heighten the mood of turbulence and danger. The sharply receding lines formed by the sides of the boat intersect with the action of the sail, which sweeps across the boat in a sweeping counter-movement to the movement of the boat. The tension created by these pictorial devices captures the viewer's own sense of turmoil as the space beyond the picture plane seems to break into the viewer's world. As we gaze upon Tissot's masterful depiction of the storm at sea, we too, like the disciples in that boat, must struggle to remain faithful to Jesus' promise that he will always be with us. November, Domenichino, Saint Cecilia with the choir. Music has long performed a vital role in Christian worship and prayer. From the earliest time, Christians have used various instruments, together with the human voice, to symbolically recall the divine music which, as we read in scripture, fills the heavenly realm. Alongside the angels, who are believed to address God in celestial music making, certain saints also were associated with music. The early Christian noblewoman, Cecilia, is venerated as the patron saint of music. This Roman martyr, according to legend, was martyred in the third century by the pagan Roman emperor. Her association with music comes from the belief that in her wedding to a pagan nobleman, Valerian, Cecilia expressed her fidelity to Christ by singing of her love for Christ. Valerian subsequently became a Christian. Eventually, Cecilia, Valerian and several companions were martyred for their refusal to sacrifice to pagan gods. The Bolognese artist Domenichino painted several images of Saint Cecilia. In the version reproduced, we see the beautiful young woman playing a violin. Over the centuries, artists have depicted her with various instruments, including the flute, organ, harp or cello. 
At the left of the painting, we see the pipes of a small organ. Such instruments were typical in Europe in the 17th century. Saint Cecilia became a favourite subject of artists in the 17th century, following the discovery of her body in 1599 in the Roman church dedicated to her. December, Giovanni Antonio Portanone, Adoration of the Magi and Adoration of the Shepherds, 1530-32. The North Italian artist Portanone took his name from the small town where he grew up in northwest Italy. A contemporary of Michelangelo, he later worked in Venice, where his rival was the great master Titian. This detail, from a fresco in the church of the Madonna della Campagna, Piacenza, a small Italian town near Milan, includes many of the features typical of the artist. Like Titian and other North Italian artists, Pordenone breathes life and warmth into his figures and setting through the use of colour and light. From the sparkling golden reflection of the goblet presented by the Magi at right, to the lush green landscape in the distance, the scene depicted attracts the viewer's attention. The subject, the adoration of the Magi, includes characters whose appearance conveys a convincing lifelikeness. The two Magi, we glimpse only the head of the Magi who kisses the Christ child's foot at left, especially have the kind of individualised features that suggest they are in fact portraits of contemporaries. Details of setting and costumes are sensitively differentiated so that the luxurious softness of the fur trim on the Magi's cloak contrasts with the rustic palings of the wooden fence. The Virgin and Child, situated midway between Joseph at left and the Magi at right, cannot fail to capture the viewer's gaze. The red sleeve of Mary's dress creates a dramatic focus. Mary fixes her attention on the child, while the kneeling Magi reverently grasps Christ's flesh. The intimacy of the Magi's gesture evokes the mystery of the incarnation of the God who is both human and divine. Symbolically, the colours of Mary's costume remind the viewer of her son's humanity. Red recalls the flesh, while his divinity is suggested by the blue of the heavens.